previously on Science for All. Is it possible to glue these two sides together and these two sides together all at once? Well, I didn't succeed. Now the answer. In the 1950s, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology welcomed a new arrogant genius, the great John Nash. Yes, the one that was portrayed in the movie A Beautiful Man as a socially deficient autistic nerd who would become schizophrenic and try to communicate with aliens through newspapers was also an unbearable pretentious genius who flew to Switzerland to give away his passport to become stateless and fathered an illegitimate child. Yeah, he had a long and complex life. Anyways, at some point his colleague Ambrose Warren couldn't bear him anymore, so he just told him, if you're so smart Nash, why don't you solve the embedding problem for manifolds? I don't know if you got that, but it's a difficult problem. In fact, at Nash's time, this was a 100-year-old open problem. But Nash didn't bother to try. He first went through all the offices of MIT, telling his colleagues that he had cracked it. And he did that just to see their reactions. Really? You solved the embedding problem for manifolds? What? You proved the isometric embedding problem? To his contentment, his colleagues were very impressed. No, I don't believe you. No, that's not possible. No, it's, it's an unfeasible problem. How could you solve it? Tell me the proof, tell me the proof. And only then did Nash figure out that this problem was worthy of his attention. Yeah, I told you, he's a bit pretentious. But guess what? He did crack it. Nash's solution to the embedding problem came in two parts. A year after he was given the problem, he solved a simpler but very counterintuitive version of it. It then took him two more years to crack the full version of the isometric embedding problem. That's a nice story, but what does this have to do with gluing opposite sides of a square? The problem of gluing opposite sides of a square is actually a particular case of the embedding problem. But first, let me tell you why this problem is so interesting. To do so, you need to imagine what it would be like to be living inside this square, this square whose sides are glued together. If you're a bit older like me, you might remember this game, it's called Pac-Man, and basically you're that guy and you're moving in this square, and whenever you go out on this direction, you appear back on the left. That's because when you glue the square together, the two opposite sides come together. And so when you leave that way, you come out the other way. And the same thing holds, obviously, for up and down as well. So let's really, really imagine that we are living inside the square whose sides are glued together. Really imagine that we are Pac-Man itself. What is the universe like in this case? Well, you can see that it's a universe that has no edge, but it is finite. Yeah, really, there's only this amount of space. The space is just this square, and as well, there's no edge. Well, it's actually glued together, so it's not an edge for Pac-Man, for someone who's living inside this sheet of paper. Now here's an even weirder part. If you're living in here, if you're looking in this direction, well, what you see is your back. If you're looking in this direction, you're going to see your back as well. Whatever direction you see, you see yourself. In fact, you're going to see an infinite number of yourself in this universe. Another way of looking at this universe is to realize that it's all as if we had copy-pasted our square to complete what's on the other side of the edges. This way, Pac-Man's world is actually a tiling of the entire two-dimensional plane with copies of itself. In this perspective, it's easy to see why Pac-Man may see an infinite number of copies of himself. 
But don't forget that if we actually lived within this universe, this viewpoint would be out of our reach. More generally, it's hard to see the geometry of this good square when you're living inside it. It's probably easier to look at it from an outside perspective. By Nash's time, this had become a very important question. That's because a hundred years before, the German mathematician Bernard Himmann had proved that you could define the most general kind of geometry by gluing together overlapping tiny sheets of paper. This is the intrinsic approach to geometry that Albert Einstein would later use to define the geometry of our space-time in his theory of general relativity. But people asked, could we take an extrinsic viewpoint on Riemann's intrinsic geometry? Could a four-dimensional space-time be regarded as a sort of single sheet of paper in a flat, higher dimension space? Or, to make it simpler, can we view Pac-Man's two-dimensional world as a closed surface embedded in our three-dimension space? And in our case, can we glue opposite edges of a square? These crucial questions went unanswered for a hundred years. So in the 1950s, Nash said, yes, you can. He did crack it, but he didn't say how. And that's because his solution was an existential solution. He only proved that there had to be a way to glue opposite sides of a square. And in fact, as you might have guessed by now, it's a very difficult problem. In fact, it's only in 2012 that a team of French mathematicians under the name of the Heavier Project managed to crack it, to really crack it, to give an explicit way of gluing opposite sides of a square. Here's how it looks. Just enjoy. I know what you're thinking. That donut-like surface cannot be it. It cannot be a flat square whose opposite sides have been glued together, but it is. The trick is to curve the square to create all these ripples. And you can see that you need a lot of these ripples. The big ones circle around the surface, but there are also smaller ones in a near perpendicular direction, and still smaller ones in still another direction, and so on, and so on, and so on. This construction is inspired by the idea of fractals. But it's actually not a fractal, because fractals are rough, while this is actually smooth. It's what you might call a smooth fractal. In any case, whatever name you want to give it, there's one thing we can surely all agree on. This thing is freaking awesome. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I think we're really getting into some seriously awesome topics with these curved geometry stuff. And next time we're going to talk about soccer balls. Now if you're a soccer fan, you definitely know that these balls are made of hexagons and pentagons. That means six-sided shapes and five-sided shapes. But why? Why is it? Does it have to be the case? Could we make a better design of soccer balls? Could we make them more round? So, why do balls have the shape they have? This is what I want you to think about for next time. Please, 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 please share this video. It's very important that you share this video on Facebook, Google, or Twitter, or whatever, because the future of this channel already depends on you sharing these kind of videos. You can also subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss the future videos. And also here I've put two links. So the first link up there is a Science for article I wrote about uh, this uh, flat square whose opposite sides have been glued together. And here's, please check their website. It's the website of the Heavy Air Project, the project that came up with the, the shape and the video that I presented. And I want to thank them really for making their videos open source. And I hope I'll see you again.